Tens of thousands of Russians took to the streets in protest at United Russians' electoral victory back in December 2011, and it quickly became apparent that all was not well in President Vladimir Putin's realm. In fact, our next guest says it was indicative of a growing opposition movement in Russia. Mark Bennett joins us now from Moscow via Skype. He's the author of the book Kicking the Kremlin. Hello. Hello. Good evening. Okay, let's start by talking about the man at the center of Russia, Vladimir Putin, of course, that longest serving leader of Russia since Stalin began his third term as president 2012, uh, served before that a short term as PM, and now he could stay in power until 2024. Mark, I want to uh, go back to the beginning of Putin as the leader of Russia back in 2000. How would you characterize Russia at the time? Uh, Putin inherited Russia from uh, Boris Yeltsin, who's a uh, the first post-Soviet leader, and uh, Russia at the time was in a, in a terrible way, uh, politically, economically, socially, and um, Putin basically came in and cleaned up a lot of things. So for the first, the first, his first term, everyone was, was, was very, very pleased with him. And when he comes into power, so we're about 10 years after, you know, the official end of the Cold War, what's his goal? It's a guy who was a mayor at one time, he comes in, he now rules a very vast country. What's his objective when he takes over as president? Um, I think his, his objective was to was to restore a sense of stability to Russia. I mean, he, he said Russians have had no stability for the last 10 years. We, we need to give them this feeling again. And to his credit, he did it. I mean, when he took over, salaries weren't being paid. Crime was rampant. Um, there, were, there were lots and lots of problems. Uh, but Putin... So he's sort of seen as a savior? Uh, yeah, he was certainly a savior for, the, for his first term, yeah. All right, I want to read uh, something from your book about something you call Putinism. So you've wrote, written this, but take a listen to it. You write, Putinism, this strange new hybrid of Soviet-type authoritarianism and free market morals, was based on the concept of sovereign democracy. The malleable term drew heavily on the works of one of Putin's favorite philosophers, Ivan Ilyin, an intellectual exiled by Lenin, who believed that Western-style democracy was not only unsuitable for Russia, but also harmful. Russia, Ilyin believed, required a united and strong state power, dictatorial in the scope of its powers. Sovereign democracy, you write, essentially meant that the state should exert robust controls over a nominally democratic political system, one that was free of any foreign influences whatsoever. The political playing field was open to both the left and the right and everything in between, but the number one rule, inflexible for participation, was the Kremlin is always right. Okay, Mark Bennett, I mean, some people believe that, that a country as vast as Russia, as big, as diverse as Russia, can only exist with an authoritarian leader, either a czar or, or a dictator. What are your thoughts on that? Um, well, his, his, history would seem to indicate that that's correct, that um, Russia does need authoritarianism. Of course, um, not everyone agrees with that. And when the protests started in 2011, and even before this, a uh, growing uh, number of the so-called middle class, so-called creative class in Russia, began to think that maybe they'd perhaps like a little um, softer, less authoritarian type of leader. And do you think they're right? I mean, do you, do you think this is a country that needs, quote unquote, needs a strong man or could, could it have, you know, a, a different structure? Well, obviously it could have a different structure. It would take a long time to develop though. I mean, even the opposition movement is based basically around the concept of a savior, you know, Alexei Navalny, who's basically the opposition's de facto movement. A lot of the criticism coming to him is that his his followers see him as like the savior of Russia rather than just a politician. You know, so uh, there's a very deep need in the Russian psyche maybe for a savior figure. And then of course they get the savior, and then they get disappointed in the savior, and they look for another one. So it's, it's been going on for centuries. Mm. You um, write that supporters of Putin regularly, you know, point the finger, accuse the United States, especially the State Department, for interference, for intervening in Russia's domestic policies, for financing the opposition. It sounds like the accusations we heard during, during Soviet times, Mark. And uh, is there still that strong sense of anti-Americanism in Russia 2014? Or how do they feel about the West and namely America? Um... For Putin's first two terms, anti-Americanism wasn't particularly pronounced. Um, but after he kind of like lost, again, the middle class, the creative classes, he kind of realized it was to his, to his advantage to portray the West as this kind of morally bankrupt um, evil empire, if you will. <laughs> and he's, he's been accusing the West of being godless, which is kind of ironic because it's um, kind of the same thing that American conservatism's 
North American conservatives hurled this kind of allegation at, 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 Russia, at the Soviet Union. So, but I mean, your uh, anti-Westernism is definitely on the up, yeah. Even people who are maybe like five, six, seven, eight years ago wouldn't have, wouldn't have um, had any particularly anti-Western sentiments. They're now willing to say things like the West is immoral, the West wants to destroy Russia, um, which is why a lot of the criticism on Russia has to be has to be accurate. I mean, you see, you see a lot of um, hyperbole in Western reporting of Russia, which is why I think it's vital that when you criticize Russia, when you report on Russia, you have to make sure that your criticism reporting is, is accurate, precise, and, and, and consistent. Otherwise, it just gives the Kremlin state media the chance to say, look, the West is lying. And a lot of times it is. Well, well give me an example when, uh, to, to, to make your point there that sometimes the Western media is lying about Russia. Well, for example, the anti-gay law, which has caused such a fuss now in, in Russia. Um, for example, the New York Times wrote a leader that gay people have been rounded up by police on the streets of Moscow simply on suspicion of being gay. Um, this is just it's, it's not true. It's, it's, it's very far from the truth. And there have been uh, comparisons with Nazi-era persecution of Jews, for example. This is not happening. I mean, it's, it's a clumsy piece of law. It's a clumsy piece of legislation, which is entirely designed to boost Putin's support among the more conservative heartland. But it's also important to point out that no one's been jailed over it. No one's lost their liberty. Um, less than a dozen people have been fined, and the fines are around $100, $150. So, as again, while I said, it's not particularly pleasant. Or it's, not, it's, 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 it's just wrong to say that it's reminiscent of Nazi-era prosecution of Jews. Well, interesting. We, I mean, we were just having a conversation about the, the anti-LGBT uh, laws and how it sort of fits into the Russia that Putin is, is trying to, to build. And I want to get back to the point of, of this anti-Americanism that you say is sort of festering and brewing and emboldening. I mean, does Putin, in order to survive, need a foreign enemy? I mean, is this part of a, a strategy of his? Increasingly, yeah. I mean... Russia's got massive problems right now, for example, soaring HIV rates. Some areas of Moscow now, 11% of pregnant women when they're going for tests are being um, are proven positive for HIV. Uh, corruption is a massive problem. There are lots of, lo lo lots of problems which potentially could split Russia, could destroy Russia. And so obviously now it's to Putin's advantage to uh, um, kind of direct that kind of discontent and hatred towards the West, which is what he's been doing for quite some time. And the anti-gay law is part of this. I mean. I don't think Putin per se really cares that much about like Russia's morals or Russia as this kind of uber religious nation. It's just the image he likes to give, you know. And, and, but he 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 doesn't actually do much to back it up. It's just it's just it's, it's just populism. He's just seeking to portray himself as like uh, the defender of traditional values. All right. Well, I want to talk about the people within Russia who are standing up against Putin. The opposition is quite diverse. I mean, everything from uh, liberals to xenophobic nationals. Can you just briefly, Mark, uh, describe the different factions in the opposition for us? Uh, well, it's kind of also important to point out that right now the opposition has collapsed. I mean, there's no, there's no viable opposition movement against Putin now. Yeah, after the protests of 2011, 2012, lots of people were jailed. Lots of the leaders were hit with criminal criminal charges. So um, there's there's no strong protest movement now. But when it started, there was everything from the left front, which is um basically uh, a very hard left movement, whose leader wore a Stalin T-shirt to his wedding, for example. And they're unashamed um, Stalinists, basically. Uh, then there's Alexei Navalny, who's kind of like the leader of the middle class and the, and the, and the hipsters, if you were, who's um, made his name as an anti-corruption blogger, uh, who's also got kind of like unsettling nationalist tendencies. And then there's kind of like smaller, kind of Western-style Democrats. There's monarchists and like Greens. So when the protest started, they all just came together and consolidated around the rallying cry of um, uh, Russia без Putin, which means uh, Russia without Putin. But apart from that, there wasn't very much that united them. Ha have they collectively um, been able to do any damage to Putin? You say, I mean, they're basically defunct now, but uh, have they been able to do any damage to Putin's control and firm grasp over Russia? Um, I think their main achievement was that they may slightly brought about a change in the mindset, whereas if before Putin was seen as the only person who could lead Russia, now there's kind of, in some people's minds, some, some people have started to entertain the thought that perhaps Putin isn't the only one, as it were, uh, especially Alexei Navalny, in Moscow at least, who 
came second in recent elections for uh, for mayor in Moscow. And he got like 30% or something, but um, it was fairly obvious that the vote had been rigged. Not that he probably would have won, but just for an opposition figure to get 30, 30% in an election against the Kremlin's backed candidate five, six, seven, eight years ago would have been unthinkable. So they've slightly cracked this kind of veneer of invincibility that Putin had for many years. I think that's their main achievement. And the mindset as well, that before people tended not to be that interested in politics, whereas now they're more and more willing to go on the streets and protest. Uh, you know, on the one hand, you say the opposition movement has been weakened because of the clampdown by Putin. And then on the other hand, there's people like Alexei Navalny, who, who as you say, especially people in Moscow, point to as perhaps a, a replacement or at least a challenger to Putin. Moving forward in the next year, I mean, how do you, do you see the health of the opposition movement getting healthier or weaker? Um, well, Russia's, Russia's a very hard place to predict. <laughs> it's always been very hard to predict. But... I would say there isn't going to be another flashpoint in Russian politics now until 2018, I think you like, which, which is when the next presidential elections are due. I think you're likely to see a period of stagnation again now, um, where people will just withdraw into themselves once more, especially with the kind of darkening political and social mood right now. Um, so I, I would, wouldn't hold out much hope for the opposition right now. Well, I want to talk to you in a moment. I'm going to read another passage from your book about people sort of, um, you know, minding their own business, if you will. But I just want to, before I do that, ask you about Putin supporters, because you write in your book that Putin says these supporters that you characterize as rent -a crowds in other words, paid supporters. But, I mean, is there a legitimate group of Russians, people that legitimately support Vladimir Putin? Yeah, obviously, yeah, there's many people who support him. But his, his support is increasingly based. It's kind of increasingly tepid. It's more... I don't see, a lot of people don't see anyone else who could rule Russia. So it's kind of like he's the best of all possible evils. You know? I mean, I don't know, Russians are th afraid of um, instability. They've had instability for, for many years. Uh, most recently, of course, during the 1990s when Yeltsin was in charge. So I mean, Putin's message is always stability, stability, stability. And uh, the Kremlin kind of underlines their belief that only Putin can guarantee this. So. While, I don't know, I mean, I think the rare and rare to find like a fervent, rabid Putin supporters, but they just don't see anyone else who could take his place right now. Mm. Okay, I want to talk, uh, read a quote from your book. This is talking about ordinary Russians. Um, here's what you wrote. And so Russians stayed for the large part silent as the independent media was strangled, the courts and parliament tamed, the money that should have been used to build up vital infrastructure was often siphoned out of the country. People agreed on a pact with the devil, said Oleg Orlov, the veteran head of Memorial, that's Russia's oldest human rights organization. They said, we will stay out of the social and political process and concentrate on our private lives. Just don't touch us and leave us a small slice of the profits from your oil booty. You go on to write, it was as like the Russians like to say, a simple case of sausages in exchange for freedom. Sausages predictably won out. What good is freedom of speech if my fridge is empty? An elderly woman asked me in the central Russian city of Voronezh midway through Putin's second term. So Mark, with the opposition faltering, what's it going to take to convince the majority of Russians that they can, on the one hand, um, have freedom, and on the other hand, still maintain their private lives? Um, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I, if I knew that for certain, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd become a political advisor to the opposition. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, very, it's very hard to... I think it will take... I think it will take a, the passing of another generation, at least, before uh, a lot of people start to think in a more in the way that we, we see as a kind of like Western mindset. Um, because right now, especially outside of Moscow, that is basically the situation. It is like sausages over freedom, you know, and most people prefer sausages. Um, you know, we, we talked a little bit about Putin being sort of this strong man, uh, perhaps people see him as a dictator or, or czar-like, but you also write that people have to realize that Putin, compared to his predecessors, is the most democratic leader Russia has had in its history. And you, you, you said that people sort of accept him as the only guy available right now, that he's the lesser e evil. Say something happens to Putin, say the tide turns. I mean, is there someone who could credibly step up and replace him other than Navalny? There's a few people within the Kremlin, but I mean, uh, there's uh, Shaigu, for example, who's the defense minister right now. He's fairly popular. But I mean, if anything happened to Putin, I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. If you're talking about something like a heart attack, for example, then Russia, I think, would be plunged into a period of 
utter instability for a while because he really the whole system does revolve around him completely. So I mean, if you do take Putin away from Russia, you're going to lose a lot of that stability which Putin has brought in to an extent. As the world so. focuses on on Russia during the Olympic Games, I mean, what what should we in the West, who I think sometimes don't understand Russia, you pointed out that sometimes there are, there are errors in the Western media. What do we need to know about Vladimir Putin's Russia? What do we fail to understand? Um, I think it's important just to, to, to understand that, like like you pointed out from my book, that he is the most democratic leader Russia has ever had. I mean, he's arguably even more democratic than Boris Yeltsin, who shelled Parliament when they didn't agree with him. Putin's never done anything like this. So I think it's important to point out that while Putin, yeah, he is an authoritarian leader, um, he's also not a monster yet. I mean, he's not he's not an Assad, he's not a Gaddafi. He, when the protests were taking place, he didn't send tanks, he didn't send soldiers with guns to, to mow people down. They let the protests take place. So I think I think Putin has a very, might even sound strange to say, but in some cases, in some incidences, he has a kind of a, a grudging respect for, for the law. I mean, obviously, they, they, the Kremlin manipulates the law when it needs to, but um, so, for example, you get a permit to rally, and you will be allowed to rally most of the time. Obviously, if it's to their advantage to break the rally up, to prove that the opposition is all made up of violent thugs, and they will do that. But what, what should people know about Putin's Russia? People should, 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 should understand that like, lots of Russians are uh, satisfied right now with Putin's Russia because they don't really see an alternative. Mark Bennett, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.